So right, welcome back everybody. Uh, let's continue where we where we left off. Um, hopefully everybody's kettle has been has boiled by now, but um, you know if not, rush back. Um, we'll uh, we'll ease you in in gently. Um, so following on from um, our colleagues from Medilink and um, the Midlands Airspace Alliance, um, I'll do a quick introduction to the SDC um, for those of you who are unaware um, of who we are and what we do. Um, so. If you all bear with me for a moment while I share my screen. <coughs> so, I hope you can all see that now. Right, so uh, Silverstone Technology Cluster, um, in terms of our area, um, we're looking at roughly an hour driving time radius from Silverstone. Um, so as you can see um, on the map here, um, it's roughly that sort of area. Um, that area was investigated in 2016 um, by SQW, the same people that in, uh, investigated the Cambridge phenomenon, um, where there's two very well established clusters in Cambridge, uh, one on um, mobile communications and one on uh, biotech. Um, so they looked into the area to, uh, to see if there was a, a cluster there. Um, and what they found that in that area, which is a relatively small area within the UK, uh, there were roughly four and a half thousand businesses involved in advanced engineering. Um, what was very interesting and, and one of the key things that came out of that is um, obviously Silverstone, um, the name kind of provokes motorsport, uh, but actually motorsport is only about 20% uh, of what the people do in, in this area. Um, and it's actually therefore very much multi-sectorial. Um, because even though a lot of the companies had their origins in motorsport, they've since all diversified into different markets. Um, and so we're talking aerospace, we're talking autos, um, automotive, marine, uh, medical, fast-moving consumer goods, um, pretty much anything you can think of, um, and we'll have companies um, operating, operating within it. Um, what was very, very interesting that, that came out of it is that they asked uh, people in this area the same question that they asked in, in Cambridge. Uh, where the question was essentially uh, a magic carpet question. So they were saying like, look, you know, you have your, your business in this area and that's great, but if you can pretend for a moment that, you know, your partner could have the same job and your kids could go to the same quality school and you can have the same nice house and all of that sort of stuff, but you could put that anywhere in the world for the benefit of your business, where would you move to? Um, and in Cambridge, the, the um, you know, most of the answers were East or West North America. Um, and here, virtually everybody said here. Um, so as judged by the people who work within it, this is the best place in the world for advanced engineering. Um, which if you think about it, is really a rather huge, huge statement. Um, and so that's certainly one of the things that's uh, sparked the creation uh, of the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Because um, what the report also identified is that normally when cl clusters emerge, um, it is usual for there to be um, a, a support um, organization there to help foster the economic ecosystem um, and they they identified that that hadn't specifically happened here um, and so there was op uh, an opportunity for such an organization to come into being and address some of the the, the shortfalls um, so the people that commissioned the, the, the report um, as a result of that research then um, founded the Silverstone Technology Cluster um, so we're a not-for-profit organization, um, and our aim is to support the high-tech engineering businesses in that area. Um, and it's very much um, based on methodology that Cambridge Wireless use. So obviously Cambridge Wireless look after the wireless communications cluster in Cambridge. You know, clues in the name there. Um, and just like them, uh, we have the three main pillars of our work, which is promotion, support, and thought leadership, as I'll discuss in a, in a moment. Um, but I would like to give a, a specific shout out to our founding members, which is obviously Silverstone Park, Barclays Bank, Grant Thornton, EMW, Hexagon, uh, and then there's Ellsbury Bell District Council, as well as South North Hampshire Council, um, who were really the, body to, to, uh, the bodies that came together um, and founded us in, um, in 2017. So we started trading in 2017. Um, so going through the, the main strands of what we do, um, so promotion is, is kind of twofold. Not only do we want to uh, promote the cluster as a whole um, and, and, and make everybody sort of understand, um, you know, that message that we got from all the companies that this is, you know, um, one of the best places in the world to for advanced engineering. 
um, and, and to really emphasize the enormous quantity of highly innovative um, businesses and individuals that all reside in, in that area um, that, quite frankly, can help you solve uh, whatever your next technological problem is. Um, you know, hugely important, important message. Um, also, the, um, also the, um, the aspect to, to promotion is uh, what I would term internal promotion. And so it's not just about promoting the, the cluster as a whole, but it's also to make sure that all the companies within the, the cluster um, are aware of each other. Um, and, and we do a lot in terms of bringing people together and encourage them to, to collaborate. Um, so obviously there's things like the, you know, our website, which is a huge tool that our members use with, with like a directory. Um, but we also organize a lot of networking events. Uh, we organize events like these. We have a, a membership forum. Uh, we're active on LinkedIn and through social media as well. So there's an awful lot of stuff that we do to, to bring people together and encourage them to, to collaborate. Um, so that kind of concludes the, the, the promotional aspect. If we then move on to support, um, with support, we, we really mean business growth. Um, and so it's really about um, helping businesses move their business to, to, to the next level. And it's, it's something that was um, indicated in the report as well where a lot of the businesses start um, and, and, and grow very quickly and it's it very much engineers led um, and so they're very much um, focused on problem solving so they, they solve a problem, solve the solution for money, move on to the next problem, do the same thing. You know, and in doing so they employ people, they get kids, they buy premises and you know after a while they, they run a good size um, business and are, and are doing really well. Um, but it's usually at the point where you have one or two million turnover, you have 20 to 30 people, where the scale-up um, aspect really comes in, into being. And that's where we exist to try and, and support them. Um, because all of a sudden, you need to recruit people that you don't know. You need to recruit people with skills you don't know anything about. Access to finance becomes a big thing. You know, uh, business strategy, marketing strategies, IP strategies, all these elements then come into being. And... You know, obviously, if you're an engineer, you're not necessarily okay with all of those um, because you haven't started off as a, a well-rounded businessman necessarily. You've started off as an engineer wanting to solve problems. Um, and so with, with all of that um, aspect, we're, we're here to support as well. So we've done things like uh, teamed up with Frankfurt University or one of our members um, who offer a scale-up course, uh, scale course for our members. We do things like... Um, um, informational mastermind podcast where we bring experts together to talk about uh, specific items that are, are valuable for, for businesses. Um, you know, these podcasts can actually be, be viewed on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, we obviously do a, bit, a lot of business focused uh, events. I mean, obviously in the current environment, much more difficult, but um, you know, we've done an awful lot of webinars all available on our YouTube channel as well, um, where we highlight, you know, we get an expert in to talk about specific um, business growth topics. Um, and certainly with the, um, with the pandemic, there were a lot of um, interesting webinars, all, all you know, helping companies to help the best um, go about that. Um, and then we also have a long-term um, ambition to set up an angel investor network uh, for our clusters specifically. Again, not just to help people with access to finance, but also to um, you know, give them access to mentors and, and people who have been there and done it before and, and can impart um, a, a huge amount of valuable, valuable knowledge. Um, so that, is, is, is the support strand, as I said, we, we, there's a lot of activity sort of going on in the area um, and by all means get in touch if you, if you want to, to learn more. Um, and then the third strand of our work is uh, all focused around thought leadership. Uh, and what we do there is that we create special interest groups uh, around different areas of technology. So today this event is on the digital and advanced manufacturing special interest group. Um, which obviously looks around um, sort of manufacturing and the making of bits and, and how to do that um, with modern technology and, and in the modern age. Uh, but we have other groups as well, um, and our members would suggest different, different groups to us, um, and we would then engage with, with our entire database uh, to see if there's a need for such a group, um, and, and if there is, then, then we'll put something together. Um, and all of these groups organize events um, so we can get people together and encourage them um, to collaborate, but also, you know, inform them about the latest technologies, about funding opportunities, about collaborative projects, basically all the sort of stuff that you need to know if you're, if you're operating within, within that area. Um, and so the groups that we have at the moment, so we've got one group um, called ACES, which as you can see stands for Autonomous Connected, Electrified and Shared. Um, so that's very much in the future mobility space, a uh, very popular group, as you can imagine. Obviously, today we're here for the Digital and Advanced Manufacturing Special Interest Group. 
uh, another one of our very popular groups. Uh, we then also have a group focused around design, simulation and metrology, so very much everything sort of around um, the making of bits, which um, we have some fascinating presentations for that group for sure. Um, and then one of our latest groups is about wearable technologies, um, so really um, anything that you have in or around your person. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of medical applications within that, and so we are working together with Medilink um, on that as well. Um, and then the last, uh, the latest group that we're in the process of setting up is on AI and machine learning, um, which would be fascinating as well. And, you know, I know there's, there's other um, groups in the pipelines that we're working with various people, people on, um, and so we'll, we'll see this growing all the time. Um, and as I said, you know, each group would organize a number of different events a year that, um, you know, as a member, you can attend for free. Um, but as a non-member, you can attend as well um, if, if, you, if you pay us a fee um, to, mm -hmm. to attend the events. Um, so that kind of concludes things very, very briefly. It's, it's very, very brief um, guiding to the, the, the service and technology cluster. Um, as I said, you know, it's very much a, a not-for-profit organization, um, you know, created by industry for industry. Um, and that's very much why we're here. I mean, obviously, if, uh, if anybody wants to find out more, I mean, please do visit our website, uh, but also please do get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to, to discuss. Um, and obviously, working together with people like Medilink and, and the MAA, we're, we're hoping that, um, you know, we, we can, you know, really bring people together and, and make it a, a good, uh, productive, collaborative environment for, for everybody, um, you know, and for everybody that's listening here as well. Um, so if you have any ideas or any thoughts, please do get in touch and, and let's see what we can and make happen together. Um, so that's just a very brief overview of the of the SDC, um, which I hope you you found informative. Um, what I would like to do now is hand over to um, one of our member companies. Um, so um, we actually have two um, sort of case studies that we'd like to run through. Um, and the first one of those is um, Charpak, who've done some really interesting things. So um, with that, I'll now hand over to Niall um, to Take us through what they've done. Now, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Pim. Um, and bear with me, I'll just share my screen with you guys. We have a, a, a presentation that I'm going to give you. Uh, right. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CHARPAC, about um, who we are, what we did in the COVID crisis at the start and how we reacted to it, and also what we're doing moving forward. Um, so CHARPAC is an SME based in Huntingdon, uh, established about 30 years ago, and um, uh, we actually design and manufacture thermoformed packaging. My particular role is to uh, specify thermoform packaging specifically for uh, fragile or critical components. Uh, most of that's within the automotive industry, but we look uh, towards high performance engineering and um, other sectors as well. Uh, so basically, Chiapac manufactures bespoke thermoform plastic packaging specifically designed to provide complete solutions to supply chain problems. And uh, uh, what I want to talk to you about is the innovation. This innovation can bring real advantages to many within the UK manufacturing supply chain. So both in terms of efficiency savings and in significantly reducing harmful uh, emissions. Um, now we use um, solely uh, recycled plastics, uh, which in turn is fully recyclable uh, to manufacture uh, everything that, that we supply you. Uh, it's really important to us. Um, we help you to uh, move towards zero emissions. Um, now, uh, plastic has a bad name because the wrong products are being made and being sent to landfill or getting into the oceans. Uh, we work on a circular economy. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the United Nations uh, sustainable goal. It's uh, international standards. Um, the, uh, and so basically we use up to 90% recycled materials in our products and we control exactly how they run through the supply chain so that they're fully recyclable or they can be completely reusable in a closed loop and then recycled at the end of that use. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, 
the, the, the COVID crisis, the, uh, an awful lot of what we actually do and what we've been doing for 30 years is in the food industry, is specialised packaging in the food industry. Now, obviously, that got thrown right up in the air because all the shops closed down and people were put into lockdown. But at the same time, uh, in Huntingdon, of course, we're very close to Cambridge and we've got uh, some huge... Um, uh, well-known, nationally known NHS trust hospitals near us. And one of these hospitals approached us and said, we've got a real problem with visors. We need face visors. And um, so we developed a, a visor. Their medical staff told us that the visors that they were being sent were really uncomfortable for um, all day use. So we specifically designed a, a, a visor that was comfortable. Um, it also had to be cost effective. The other thing that the medical frontline staff told us was that we needed to supply clips for the back of them so that they were adjustable um, and, and would make them comfortable. And that these clips should also be able to be used for surgical masks because when you're wearing a surgical mask all day, it hooks around the back of the ears and that's really uncomfortable for more than an hour or two's use. And uh, so we produced all that. Now, crucially, we decided that these visors should be CE marked. And, and the reason for that um, was that it seemed like every man and his dog was trying to produce visors and there were some horrendous designs being put out under the COVID waiver. The, the government had issued a waiver of uh, the need for CE marking to try and get as much PPE as hospital out as quickly as possible. Um, so we went for the CE marking, it took a little bit of time, but we thought it was really necessary to have that independent uh, overview um, and control of what we were doing. And uh, so we are now in a position where we can supply CE marked uh, visors all over Europe for, uh, for any use, and, and we actually do. Now, at the same time as this was all happening, one of the reasons why this took us a long, longer than we would have liked to get onto market was, <laughs> this is something that hasn't been talked about at all, the fresh chicken problem. Now, everyone went, rushed to the supermarket as soon as they were told that there was going to be lockdown and stripped the shelves bare of certain products, especially fresh chicken. Um, and uh, so there was a huge sale of fresh chicken out uh, and everyone took it all home, stuck it in the freezer. The problem then was that uh, th there was a trough afterwards and uh, you can't tell chickens to stop growing, of course. So we were approached by a, a very, very major supermarket chain in the UK and they said, look, we have millions of chickens about to be slaughtered um, for food production to sell in our shops. We can't sell them. These chickens are going to be slaughtered and thrown into landfill would you believe, unless we can get packaging which will help us preserve them. And uh, so that's what we did. We put all our factory, we put a, we're, we're highly vertically integrated. So we've got our own um, uh, really well-developed design department. We have a machine shop where we make all our own tools. Uh, we made multiple designs, multiple tools, and put the whole factory day and night into uh, chicken uh, packaging production and so that's why you can now buy chicken in the supermarket to this day and um, uh, uh, and we got rid of that that crisis and, and I'm afraid that's not a glamorous story but it means that the country gets fed. Um, now what this um, my bit here has been really trailed on is something we're calling no bounce out technology one of the things we've been working on for the last year now, and um, we, we've got this fantastic design department. I know Simon Lloyd, our head of design, is listening in today. So hi to Simon, because he's done a really great job here with his team. Um, we have um, uh, Creo 3D, we have 3D scanning, we have all the latest tools in our design department. And we can make thermoformed products, trays, clamshells, and so on, to the same production tolerances as the components that go in them. Um, and this is highly unusual. Usually this sort of technology is cheap technology for you know, putting mushrooms in. Um, and, uh, but 
um, traditionally, when you actually try and use a robot to put components into a tray to process those components through a production line and out to the end customer, uh, you get what's called bounce outs. It's, it's a very simple thing. Um, the robot fills the trays at very high speed. Some of the components go in and because the trays aren't that accurate, uh, one or two components every hit uh, bounces out. And so you need one or two people uh, standing by the tray to put them back in. Now, when you're talking about manufacturing components for lithium ion batteries, for instance, that means you're contaminating the components and that can't happen. So there's a huge demand now for incredibly accurate trays that can be completely integrated within the robotic system and filled by robot um, and then go down uh, the production line and uh, uh, manipulated by robot, perhaps have a line of adhesive applied to them in exactly the right place. So the robot has to know exactly where uh, the, the component is. Uh, you can do it much much faster and cheaper if you're not having to try and identify the component with a camera. Um, and so this is something which is really proving a great success for us. We've gone within the um, uh, lithium ion uh, battery manufacturing supply chain in this country from uh, none to providing the uh, production line process trays and packaging for 10 million components a year. Uh, it's absolutely vital. So it's, it's a relatively cheap way of doing it um, and it ensures complete uh, cleanliness. Um, we do do a bit in the um, aerospace industry and uh, this is um, more for uh, higher volume components I guess. Um, as you probably know there is only a few thousand aircraft produced a year and we're looking at generally providing packaging for a higher volume components but having said that within the aircraft supply chain there are certain things that they use a lot of um, printed circuit boards here is one of them seats is another one you know you can um, thermoform um, uh, covers for armrests and uh, headrests and so on and uh, these can protect the, the seat through manufacturing uh, and also can be used um, for uh, cleaning the aircraft as well. Uh, there, there are occasions when um, the aircraft downtime can be speeded up when uh, the, the actual aircrew can have to stand on the arms and things. And uh, so if you can put a little cover over there, uh, which is easily disposable if you break it and it's cheap, that can help that sort of thing a lot. Um, so in this case, these um, uh, printed circuit boards, the, um, the tray here is designed actually to sit into a Jeffco, what's called a back zone, it just means yellow crate. And that's the equivalent of a CHEP 6429 crate, um, four crates per layer on a Euro pallet. Um, the, the tray allows the printed circuit board to be soldered robotically. It allows components to be soldered on robotically and move down the line. And then the tray is designed to stack up within the, the crate um, with an empty tray on top of it so that these components go through the whole production line and on to the end user anywhere in the world um, completely clean. Um, so you've minimized human contact and then stacked them directly and got them out to your customer. Um, we also do a similar thing in, uh, in the medical industry. It's, it, it's not a huge area for us, but it's somewhere we'd like to grow. We don't have clean room um, uh, uh, facilities, but we, we are ISO 9001 2015, but we're also BRC food safe accredited. So our whole factory is guaranteed food safe. So we can guarantee a very high level of cleanliness and um, uh, and lack of contamination uh, for any of our products. The whole process controls are all properly written in. So it's cost effective, clean packaging. Uh, most of what we do in the high performance uh, automotive uh, engineering sectors, um, all these uh, manufacturing sectors are covered by uh, NDA. We, we, we're very happy to uh, uh, sign 
uh, our clients NDAs. What we tend to do is we'll sign an NDA with people, um, we'll then have a look at their problem, we'll provide designs that we think will help them. This is all free of charge, this is a free consultation um, and then if the client likes the design and thinks it's a good idea they can go ahead and buy prototypes that's relatively cheap and we can test it make sure it works and then we can go to full tooling and full production and even full tooling is you, you're talking about five to ten percent the cost of for example injection molded uh, component tooling this is a a very very cost effective fast way of ensuring that your products aren't contaminated the reason I'm talking about NDAs here is that, as you can see, these are just nuts and bolts. I can't show you the, the real components, unfortunately. All I can show you is how the concept works. So uh, the, in this case, these nuts and bolts are put in trays. Uh, they're very easily uh, picked out, either robotically or by hand. Uh, they're very easily stacked. The components are protected. Um, but then the trays actually turn 380 degrees when they're empty and they all nest together so they're very easy to um, send back to source or to put into the recycling chain to actually recycle the plastics. Um, I hate putting up loads of words on a, on a, on a slide. Uh, I've put this on because I'm sure there are people who will want to actually come back to the, um, this presentation uh, when I've finished, you're very welcome to uh, to come back to it, of course. Um, have a look at it. This is basically the, the summary of uh, what I've just been talking about. Um, and uh, so I'm coming into the end of it now. Um, just to say, really, that a lot of studies have been done on the cost of packaging, on process um, packaging and process controlling components through... Um, manufacturing into the supply chain um, and, and a lot of these studies they can suggest that 90% of the cost of the packaging isn't packaging 90% of the cost is simply getting the packaging wrong and experiencing problems from that uh, and this you often see we, we, we have major OEMs in automotives telling us that they have huge problems with cardboard simply because they've gone to cheap cardboard packaging um, and they're getting contaminated components, they're getting broken components, they're getting warranty claims because the components have perhaps got damp and then they've been fitted to a, a vehicle and six months later that vehicle develops a fault. There's all sorts of problems that poor packaging um, uh, causes. Uh, there's also the sustainability uh, issues as well and we work very very hard to ensure that the the supply chain reduces emissions and um, is a sustainable su supply chain. Um, so Charpak's innovative approach always ensure, uh, ensures pristine components are delivered to the end user by controlling the environment these parts are stored and handled in and that's even using modified atmosphere if necessary we can seal them in a in an inert atmosphere and so this significantly increases the reliability reduces warranty claims and reduces your problems uh, please feel free to contact me here's my details make a note of them take a screenshot um, ring me email me we're very very happy to help we're, we're we we're inquisitive we want to talk to you we want to see what your issues are what your problems are and we want to help you um, and suggest solutions you know it doesn't cost you anything we're we're, we're just simply a curious innovative company uh, and that's that's basically our business model um, and that's pretty well all I've got to say in this presentation, I think. So I shall now hand you back to Pim and thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, no, that's, that's great. Uh, I know that we've got a question coming in, but I'd, I'd like to hand over to Kieran um, now and then we can probably do a, a combined Q&A later on. Thank you, Pim. Uh, afternoon, everybody. And uh, great to see so many people on the call. And, and, and first, I should apologise for, for hijacking again one of my own events and, and one of the STC events, I'd, I'd really encourage other people to, to step forward and, and come up with ideas for these in the future. If you've got ideas for this event, please please approach me, Niall or, or Pim as steering um, group committee members for this, 
this particular uh, special interest group. So I feel a bit selfish sharing this, but I'll make it fairly brief and, and hopefully um, it won't be quite as wordy as previous ones. Niall, you completely surprised me with uh, mentioning chickens. I wasn't expecting that one. That was uh, caught us off guard. Right. Um, so opportunities in the new, nor new normal uh, post COVID-19, what does it mean? Uh, like a few, like others, I'm going to take you through a bit of a case study of some of the things we've been involved with. Um, but for those of you that don't know me or KWSP, uh, or the style of our presentations, I don't tend to like wordy presentations and uh, they tend to be shoot from the hip a bit. So apologies for that. But KWSP is a high performance engineering business based in uh, uh, well, Vista near the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Um, we concentrate on um, high performance engineering processes and solutions and manufacturing, and we are fairly sector agnostic. Uh, so if you look at this screen, which hopefully is showing on the screen now, you'll see that um, you know, we're involved in everything from, from automotive, motorsport, right the way through to uh, performance sports, uh, but also special purpose machinery design and, um, and automation. We weren't expecting ever to be involved in PPE, to be honest. Um, we, we've been involved in some medical projects in the past, um, mostly around special purpose machine design. Uh, but uh, PPE caught us off guard and, and, and came left field, but it was a, it was a result of, of this, the times we've been through. So let me take you through, um, so it would be fun to go back and like everybody else has and look at a bit of a timeline of kind of what happened. So back in February, Seems like um, a year ago now, but on, only back in February, I was in the States uh, in, in a, at a, a normal event for us to go and see some customers in, uh, in, in space and aerospace industry, um, working with DIT and doing business development and traveling around the world to do that kind of activity as we all used to. Some of you might, might remember that. Um, that was 6th of February. Then just a week later, 12th of February, I was in Italy, Northern Italy. Um, little did I realized what was about to come. Uh, I was uh, in Milan at a meeting and uh, everything, we've still had some lots of exciting projects and, and uh, this was part of one of them and, and, and things were looking really good for 2020. Uh, 10 days later, uh, back in the office, still people in the office, people actually working, it, um, something I haven't seen for some time now. We were just 10 days away from Northern Italy shutting down and our whole COVID-19 experience starting. So 16th of March, um, when things really started to pick up around the ventilator challenge stuff, and we've already heard quite a lot about that. And we realized that with Italy in trouble and um, ventilators potentially being an issue that that there may be something we could help with because we are a special purpose machine designer. We think we're innovative. We think we can come up with ideas that solve problems quickly. And we put together a small skunk works to, um, to see if there was something we could do to help in that particular space. There was a lot of noise in the press. There was a lot of noise from government about um, ventilator shortage. And we thought, well, of course we can help. That's the sort of thing we can do. And actually quite quickly, we recognized some of the issues that, uh, that were mentioned earlier around uh, certification, regulation, and actually, do you really want a ventilator built by somebody that normally builds race cars? Um, but we still thought it was worth putting out a call for, for action and say that we could help and we've got certain skill sets and certain things that certainly could be repurposed. At the time, I'd say we weren't talking about thinking about repurposing. We were more thinking about just can we help uh, and you know, what could we do? And, and perhaps selfishly also, what, you know, what commercial opportunities there would be coming out of this. Um, and being a cross-sector uh, multidiscipline business, it wasn't unusual for us to get anything involved with things that we, we'd never been involved with before. So that was um, just around 16th of March time. Uh, around 19th of March, the ventilator challenge thing started to become formalized and we actually put a, um, you know, sort of our, our, our hat in the ring and submitted the forms and, and told government what we could do. I personally felt and ended up being a little bit frustrated by that process, as I'm sure others did. I mean, it was absolutely right what was said earlier. You know, there was perhaps the, the call was too broad. Everybody threw their, their hat in the ring. It perhaps was a very difficult thing for, for government to ever try and select those. Um, 
and uh, and we realized there really wasn't too much that we could we could offer other than just to, to provide background support if someone needed it um then just one day later 20th of march this is when government announced pretty much lockdown and sort of work from home rules and 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 uh, we pressed the emergency stop button in the office and uh, you know it was it was a very strange time about a week beforehand we've made quite a lot of preparations to make sure that everybody's uh, equipment, PCs, CAD systems, um, communications could work from home. They had adequate broadband, all those sort of things. But we, we if I'm honest, I, I think we did that as a precautionary measure, thinking, you know, what if, and you know, what if the worst happened, and actually we did all have to work from home. Um, thank God we did, because it was a very easy transition to getting everybody to to decamp from the office and uh, and literally start working you know, the next, the next day, the very next day from, from their various locations at home. Um, you know, challenging times for a lot of people. Quite a few of our people are, are, um, are still fairly young and perhaps living in shared houses. And, you know, it, it, you, you realise that actually everybody's got quite different circumstances to cope with in these situations. But we managed and we still are managing. Um, but, yeah, seems, seemed a bit, um, as a business owner, it was a difficult thing to, to look at in the office and think, well, I'm paying for all of that, um, but no one's using it. It's uh, wonder how long this will go on for. Thought it might be a couple of weeks. So that was the 20th of March. Um, quite quickly at that point, uh, we were still sort of, you know, still we we were still skirting around the ventilator UK thing and seeing what we could do. And there were various collaborations cropping up, and there was one collaboration in particular that caught our attention because of our call for action before. That whole LinkedIn connection really sparked um, some, some connections that we already had coming together and, and, uh, and approaching us with an idea that they had. Um, and it was very much a knee-jerk reaction to the current situation of COVID-19. What can we do to help? PPE is a problem. Uh, face masks, face shields, all those sort of things were, were being talked about a lot. and. Uh, and Respirlab had a, an idea for a, a face mask, face shield, integrated and designed really for, for the purpose uh, needed right now, um, rather than adapting PPE that was perhaps in designed for industrial use um, and then repurposed for, for, for medical um, crisis that we were in. So it was, you know, that, that, that's how, as I sort of became involved in the project, the picture you see there, which is, and I'm not going to share with you anything that's confidential here, by the way, because it's all, it's all in public domain, these pictures. Um, that, was, that was the concept. And I thought, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's something we can help with. And certainly as a business um, in manufacturing and rapid prototyping um, and low volume manufacturing and development, we thought that was some, a skill that we could bring to really start to bring us to market quickly, recognizing that the challenge here was, was a, a time issue. You know, we need to get this product to market quickly to solve problems and and to, to coin a, a, a rather overly used phrase at the time you know to, to save lives and, and and let's forget all the commercial things and put those to one side and just get on and do it um, there's the first prototype just nine days later um, it moved on a bit quite a bit already as you can see it was um, still very simple in its concept and uh, low cost to manufacture and solve two problems. So the intention was to solve problem of the respirator and a face shield in one product. Um, and very specifically, there was we identified that um, the problem with a lot of respirators at the moment is they have a valve, which is perfectly good for protecting the user uh, from whatever it is they're breathing in but not so good for protecting other people around you with the gases you're breathing out. Uh, and pretty much all respirators of, of um, reasonable filtration rate uh, have a valve system in order to allow for the, the, the um, shortcomings in the fresh drop. So we accidentally kind of came across um, some materials, again, through not knowing anything about masks, but knowing about automotive filtration systems and uh, and hvac systems and those sort of things and discovered that we we could probably create a, a, a filtration system that worked both ways and that was that is and still remains the usp for, for the respo lab product so getting this piece part in this at that time was well we've got a load of equipment now that's not 
um, overly, overly used. You know, a lot of our, our customers at this time of the year normally would be F1 teams, uh, where we'd be making a lot of parts for wind tunnel models and, and for development. And uh, they were standing empty. All the F1 teams have gone shut down. Um, a lot of our customers, so other customers, automotive customers, had, had paused their projects in, in the wake of what was going on and waiting to see what happened. And uh, quite literally, everything had ground to halt. So we had quite a lot of capacity that we could put at this. So um, this is already by the third generation of, of um, development work we're going through here. And this, this presentation is not really about the product and about Respo Lab. It's about how we've helped with that development process using the skills that we had and the resources that were now readily available. Um, so there's a, an example of us 3D printing some of the, uh, the prototype components for, for one of the products, one of the, uh, one of the iterations. And there it is actually being used and tested. Um, this, this will happen pretty quickly. So we're now only four weeks past the original date um, that the concept was conceived. And we were still, I would say at this time, quite focused on on the drive to get this to CE marking, to get this qualified and get it into market now. Um, and it was about this time that we also realized that was probably the wrong thing because that's not actually a sustainable solution. That's a short term um, reaction to, to COVID-19 and what, and what government was telling us was needed, which was PPE. Um, we, we're now aware of many PPE orders that, that were placed by government that were no longer required as the, as the, as the situation changed in the future. So we, we felt actually we should be focusing on the longer term and actually look at this as a product that um, had um, a proper business out the back of it rather than just a short term uh, solution to, uh, to COVID-19 and, and the PPE requirements. So we kind of changed our, our focus of direction and development and recognizing also that just certifying this to COVID-19 C marking regulations would also be quite short-sighted. Uh, but we used our various additive manufacturing equipment as just a SR Strastus 900, which we use for making quite a lot of the face shield components. Um, and the thing that's, that's about the new normal, I guess, that we're talking about is that we, like many others, used teams and, and other systems that we frankly hadn't yet to use internally a lot. And we were using this now for design reviews, um, daily meetings, meetings with suppliers. Um, now Stuart wasn't wearing this mask because he was wor worried about a computer virus. He was wor wearing it because we were actually demonstrating the fit. But uh, that's, um, that, that's a really good example of how our business has changed actually. We're now using Teams for everything or Zoom. Um, at the back of the, the, the product development around Respilab, there are now two industrial solutions. There's a, a half face mask and a full face shield mask. They're qualified to EM166 and EM1827 regulations. And that's, you know, we, there's now a long term opportunity that frankly, no one ever predicted back in, in end of March, early March when, uh, when times were a bit different. And there's a sneak preview of a prototype that before it went to BSI and, uh, and further production of them. But the point of this presentation and the point of this, this, this um, conference this morning is, you know, what's the new normal and what are the opportunities within the new normal uh, post COVID-19? And uh, I think the thing that's, that's become very apparent to all of us and in particular around the PPE uh, sector is, is, is the supply chain issues and how those became broken very, very quickly because of geography and because of politics. And uh, you know, for us, the out of stock issue of PPE and the materials that we needed to make some of these parts. So for example, the filter material that we would normally use for this product wasn't readily available. And so that forced us to look at alternatives from, from other sectors that wouldn't normally be used in, in, a, in a PPE type application. But that's really what this is pointing to is, is, is the issues with uh, the supply chain that we had and what that means for us going forward post COVID-19 is how do we develop a supply chain that's more local, um, certainly more robust, uh, certainly agile, um, because let's not be um, mistaken to think that actually for the long term in the future, we're gonna buy all of our, our products in the local supply chain. It won't be economically viable. We will have to continue to look at international supply in the future, but how do we make sure that we are resilient to those things. And I think this is um, 
for the Silverstone Technology Cluster, for the MAA and, and Medilink, these are the opportunities is that we do need to look at UK manufacturing as a whole, uh, invest in UK manufacturing, make sure that we can be competitive where necessary in, against the rest of the world, um, and certainly make sure that we've got the resilience to, to supply alternatives in, in a situation like this. It may not always be a pandemic, it may be some other political issue, or it may be, um, you know, it, it, it may be simple economics of actually travel and exports and, and, and shipping becomes overly expensive. So for us, um, again, selfishly, this plays right back to the Silverstone Technology Cluster and, and one of the projects that KWSP has, which is about building um, state-of-the-art um, manufacturing facilities in the UK and invest, investing in manufacturing utilities in the UK for, for building a supply chain. For us, that means additive manufacturing, and, and some of you may already be aware of the, the digital manufacturing centre that we're opening next year, early next year at Silverstone. The building's nearly complete. We're starting to fit it out uh, in the last quarter of this year with the equipment. Um, but it's you know this, this made in Britain thing is, is is really close to KWSP, and we really believe in it. Uh, and I, I'd like to thank at this point also you know the support we've had from MAA and, and Drama and MTC and, and Semlet. For helping us make that happen and, and, and particularly with Semlet with some of the funding that we've received for that. But uh, that's that's for me what the new normal looks like post-COVID is that there'll be a greater focus uh, on um, on UK local manufacturing. I think that's the opportunity. We hope so. We're, we're, we're uh, optimistic although it's difficult to, to see really what the future is going to be like in 12 months time but we genuinely believe that for those that are investing in innovation like, like Charpak and and uh, manufacturing in the UK, there will be opportunities, not just for our um, UK customers, but, but internationally too. That's all from me, Pim, thank you. Excellent, thank you, Kieran. Um, very good and, and good to finish on a bit of a, a, an inspirational note there. Um, so um, that's excellent. Um, I mean, obviously, if anybody has any questions, please use the, the, the chat functionality, um, but I think in the interest of, of time, uh, I'd actually like to move on to the next uh, presentation, um, but we might well have an opportunity to go back to either Niall or, or Kieran um, with some questions a little bit bit later on. Um, but I think if we hand over to, to Nick Brown now, um, he can um, sort of tell us about how the pandemic situation um, sort of influenced the NHS supply chain um, and, and what has changed since there. So um, over to you, Nick, um, when you're ready. Right, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Is, is, there, is there that? So, um, I'm Nick Brown, and uh, Nicholas when I'm in trouble generally. Um, I'm the Commercial Manager at East Midlands Academic Health Science Network. Now I'm guessing probably you guys, uh, the majority of you are totally unaware of who we were because I was, and I've worked in the med medical industry for 20 plus years before I actually joined. Um, Oops. Um, so who are we? We're the innovation arm of the NHS, uh, particularly um, the East Midlands part. So for us, East Midlands is defined as Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, uh, Leicestershire, Rutland, and Northamptonshire and Lincolnshire. Uh, so we are part of the NHS England, part of the Really, we, we were created about six years ago. Uh, um, sorry, on, sorry, Nick, your, your microphone isn't particularly clear. Have you got any way of maybe moving it or doing anything? Let's see if I can pick you up. Sorry. A little bit more. Not really, actually. No. Oh. Okay. Um, I wonder. Have you got like an iPhone a headset that you could use my phone on that maybe? Yeah, let me try plugging it. Okay, that's made it work because we can't hear you at all now. 
Now, well, I think we'll have to go with that. This is one of those difficult things where we tried it earlier and it was fine. Um, but yeah, we'll have to, to do our best. That's probably the reasons why I'm not allowed to use Zoom anymore. Yeah, that's who we are. And we're, we're part of a, a 15 organization network covering the whole of uh, our whole of England. Um, our role really is to support innovators to interact with the NHS. Um, and that has historically been a real challenge for, for a lot of innovators. Um, and so far, we've pushed 330 innovations through. So, challenges for the innovators. Um, the NHS was in a desperate financial position before um, COVID hit anyway. And, and actually, long term, uh, that's going to be a problem again, I think, once we come out the other side. At the moment, we are blank checkbook. Um, and governments have told us that the, that the NHS can spend what it wants until the end of September, but at some stage, that's not going to be where we're at anymore. Um, it was interesting to, to hear a, a couple of the comments from the previous presenters. So, Steve, your, your, your comment that aerospace is not agile, uh, you've seen nothing to you that uh, interact with the NHS. We are probably the least agile organization on the face of the planet. Uh, and I think that to why the court, the PPE was a huge challenge. We, um, we kind of had a bit of a heads up of what was coming down the road in the health system. And um, it, I literally was buried by the people that could make the face shield. Uh, and some of them, as, as was described, were good quality, some of them were really poor quality. And, and the way the call from governments, I think, was also an issue because uh, we were getting contacted by people with 20,000 pairs of gloves. We did in about nine million a week um, to, to keep the system going. So these guys were all contacting into the central point for, for offers of support. And a lot of that got built to us. Okay. Nick, sorry to, to interrupt very quickly. Um, We've got a suggestion in, in, in the chat. Could you have a look um, in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and perhaps see if there's an option to select a different microphone to see if that works? Maybe even going back to the headset because it, it's still quite yeah. difficult to pick you up on, right? Okay. Try the headset again. Please bear with us while we uh, work through these technical issues. As, as mentioned, when we tested it, it was all fine earlier, so apologies. Um, but have a look at the bottom left hand screen because there should be a microphone thing there and if you press on the little arrow you should be able to select a different microphone so hopefully that might be an option. Sorry to, uh, to, to interject. So if you wiggle your mouse so you can see the share screen where you would mute or, or stop yep. your video, next to the mute button, there's an up arrow. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so if you, yeah, and you should be able to then select a um, microphone. If your headphones are plugged in, they should, should appear. Let's try that. Is that working? Um, we can hear you and it's stable, but it's extremely quiet. Okay. I'll have to share. <laughs> Are you still there? I am, yeah. Can you not hear me at all again now? No, that's better. That's better. Now. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, let's come back to the, uh, the slideshow. You, Apologies. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so what happened is, yeah, we, we had literally, I, I, I kind of got up when the, the call went out and I had 100 and, 140 emails in my inbox that morning from predominantly people that had solutions to the COVID um, supply issues, um, including all kinds of um, 
crackpot suggestions, including that, that, that we should be sending turmeric pills to everybody in the UK because that would cure COVID. Um, another guy that reckoned sitting with different colored lights arrays pushing on you was, was going to solve it. So part of the challenge for the system was to filter out the, the, the real suggestions and the real capabilities from, from those that were wishful thinking. Um, and we, we had a really busy time. I mean, I, uh, we, we kind of knew this was coming. I, I joined a, a, a video conference on the 7th of March with clinicians from all across the globe. And, and I sat and uh, watched a senior clinician from Madrid break down and cry on a conference. Um, never seen that in my life when he just said, we no longer have a health service functioning here. So we, we did get a bit of a heads up. Um, the health service was also quite smart in as much as it got us out of uh, um, it got us out of our office um, on the 13th of March. So we were we were locked down a week before because they, they wanted to keep our capability um, and, and make sure that we weren't all sat together. So your journey through uh, an innovation is uh, pretty complex. We we offer support to companies. Um, particularly uh, but to innovators so you don't even have to be a company you can be just a startup right across that that list and and I would say realistically in normal circumstances your journey from from an idea to the right hand side is at least three to five years um, now we've tried to speed that up but you're still looking probably 18 months to two years um, COVID changed everything because you could go from the left hand side to the right hand side in three weeks um, nobody asked anymore how much, it was how quickly. Um, so approach to engagement, selling to the NHS is, is not like selling to anyone else. And actually there is, there is a belief that there is an NHS. Well, there isn't. There's, uh, the NHS is really a franchise, not significantly different, I would say, to McDonald's in as much as we all have the same badge on the front door, but it's about... 35 36,000 separate independent businesses all trading under that 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 one badge so um for innovators not used to dealing with the nhs finding a path through who are the right budget holders who are your decision makers and how can you do stuff at scale um it is really really challenging so uh, to put you in the context um <laughs> This is a, a map of the stakeholders involved in one single pathway that we were operating in, which was around diabetic foot ulcers. Um, all of these people are, are linked to influencers or decision makers. So your very first thing you need to do, if you're thinking to come and, come and work in the health system, it is, is to try and understand a little bit of the complexities. Now, I used to work for a Japanese company before I joined the health service, and, and they asked me on one um, sheet of a flip chart to draw how the money moved around the NHS. And I was like, um, I only have an hour and a half. I need at least a day and a half to explain it to you. And I need the entire wall, not just a, 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 an A3 flip chart. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of level of complexity of decision making that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, Routine. So it was interesting that, that um, people were talking earlier about having uh, having significant um, procurement issues within the organisations. So um, a lot of that was suspended very briefly during the COVID process, but we're seeing it all come back now. And NHS supplies have various different towers and, and are a great way to, to kind of get in to understand because uh, otherwise you're going to go through independent procurement processes with pretty much every trust in the country. Um, and that is a long and painful process. So within NHS supply chain, we have a number of uh, what they call towers and each of the towers deals with specific pieces um, of the procurement and supply process. Um, and you know, even within NHS supplies, there, there is a challenge around um, engaging with them and PPE is really interesting because yes a lot of the rules went out out for a while but there are existing suppliers with contracts in place who um, are now actually starting to scream and shout a little bit because they're saying well now we've got stock again you should be buying from us because you have an existing contract with us and they don't come up for renewal every year 
they come up every two to three years predominantly and and one of the challenges actually that the major manufacturers were presented with was lots of other people repurposing and as was touched on earlier was a shortage of of raw materials so we had we had guys that could produce in tens of thousands of units a day but they actually couldn't get the supplies because there were people all over the country buying enough to make a hundred a day um, so some of the the regular online uh, regular on system suppliers were actually struggling because it was a raw material shortage that was stopping them from manufacturing not their ability to actually produce the goods so roots in um, digital services um, there there is another route in which is the g cloud um, this is a uh, some screenshots actually from their from their website so that again this opens every year for people to submit there's one closing 20th of july this year and then that will be closed for another year um, but on there you can put your services up there and it sits on there it's it's available for anyone from within the government organizations then to go and shop from um, and again it, it gets around the procurement process so i i handle the procurement process of uh, the ahsm for a lot of our projects and, and on average they take six to eight months for us to complete um, with g cloud you can normally do it within two uh, on the basis you are literally buying from a, an existing shopping list it's, it's it's a bit like doing an online shop you, you go in you select your goods you hit the button and then they get delivered so existing support schemes there are dozens of them out there um, I, I, I would suggest that anyone looking to repurpose into working with the health system um, tries and has a, a, a fish through all of these some of them are working now some of them um, are temporarily suspended obviously due, due to the what we call the new normal um, but yeah there's there's lots of routes there to get support and i think if you're not familiar with uh dealing with the nhs it it, it really is key that you actually engage with some of the organizations that can point you in the right direction um because we are a, a, as i said a very complex beast and um, i remember shortly after i joined the ahs and having a discussion with a colleague who'd been there uh, in the health system for nearly 20 years. I'd been in the industry sector for nearly 20 years. And we agreed that neither of us spoke the same language. Um, and, and she turned around to me and said, well, you know what? The uh, industry needs to learn to speak the language of the NHS. And I turned around to her and said, do bear in mind that the NHS is only 2% of the global healthcare market. So if you're an international company supplying healthcare equipment, why would you bother? It's just too difficult. And actually part of the reason I'm at the AHSN is I used to do a Europe, Middle East, Africa role um, for the company I was working for previously. And, and actually what brought me back was the fact I was never in the UK because although I was a UK resident, it was far easier for me to do business in uh, um, you know, Morocco, Turkey, Spain, South Africa. So I, I was never home because uh, I went I, I went where the cash was easiest to access and, and that wasn't the NHS system. So things to remember, the NHS doesn't buy products, it buys solutions to problems. Um, you know, I did two years as a marketing manager. I used to list down the functions that, that, that my products had. And what I actually should have been saying is, you know what, it has a backlit display. That means you don't turn the lights on in the middle of the night when you do the OBS and wake the entire ward up. Um, it has 96 memories. Well, guess what? That doesn't mean anything to anyone. But if you tell them that means you can do your 15 minute OBS on a patient for 24 hours and recall all of them back onto the screen, that suddenly you solve the problem. So. We focus very much now on making sure you've got a clear elevator pitch, but that elevator pitch is a value proposition. So as, as a commissioner of, of kit, um, there's, there's something like 30,000 products that go uh, into an average hospital in a week. So um, they don't have time to look at all of them. So your, your challenge is, is to, if you want to supply to them, is to explain to them why buying from you solves a problem that, that crops up on their desk uh, on a frequent basis. And the AHSN, as I said, we are, we're, there's a network of us 
Um, absolutely come and engage. Come and engage, I would suggest, at the idea stage. But then also, once, you're, once you've kind of gone through that and you're heading out the other side into producing products um, and wanting to, to get in to access the market, come and talk to us. Um, your evidence, uh, our evidence base system is horrendous. Um, I, I sat with uh, I sat with some clinicians before COVID, who told me that their patients in in Nottingham weren't the same as in Derby. Now this was a product for uh, patients with uh, enlarged prostate, and so I just turned around to them and said, "Well, are, are they are they all men? Yes. Do they all have a penis? Yes. Are they all over the age of fifty? Yes. So what's different about them? Well, they're in Derby and we're in Nottingham." Um, so that give you a, a level of the idea of we deployed this product. It was in wide scale use in, in Derby. They absolutely loved it. It saved time. It saved money. But the guys in Nottingham weren't prepared to accept that evidence. You know, what twenty miles up the road. So I think there is a there is a challenge around what. So you can comply to all the standards in the world, but they're going to ask you the question of what happens when you actually put it into the real world. And I always use the analogy that that I'm perfectly capable of driving at 30 miles an hour and using my indicators every time I change lane when I have a police car behind me. And, and that's that's your clinical trial. Your real world is the minute that disappears, I only occasionally use the indicators and are probably traveling nearer 40 than 30. Um, so that's the thing about real world evidence as opposed to clinical evidence um, needs to be there. Don't do pilots. We, we, we are famous in the NHS for doing pilot studies. I personally, if I went back to work in industry again, would not do a pilot unless there was a commitment that if we hit X number of goals or X number of reductions or whatever, um, that it was going to be commissioned because otherwise you are literally wasting your time and money. Um, and at the end of it, you won't secure any long-term business going forward. Um, no brainers. That, that, that's a great one. Everyone that comes to comes to me has told me that they're going to save time, money, patients are going to do better. Um, actually, if I saved all the money that's been offered to me in the five years I've been at the AHSN, the NHS actually wouldn't need a budget because um, the savings are so great that it actually would have equate to everything we spend. Um, but then you look at the bottom and um, the bottom is the real world that, that we will be returning to in the not too distant future, which is a queue of ambulances outside an A&E. These are actual photos, by the way. Um, and then that is uh, an A&E when there just wasn't enough beds. Um, the next one along, um, prizes for anyone that can guess what that is, that's a shower tray in one of our East Midlands hospital trusts. Um, and they were incapable of keeping those clean. So you can imagine what what else is going on, and, and then the next picture along, that was um, that was a kitchen area within one of the wards, um, at, at which a patient also took a picture of a rat on that. So yeah, yeah, there are real world challenges, um, and actually, we're out of one in some extent. So the the COVID cases at the moment, for instance, in Nottingham, there's only four patients in ICU with COVID right now, which is you know not massively excessive. Um, but what we do have is about two years worth of surgery to catch up on. So the next challenge actually is, is probably not going to be COVID related. It's going to be how do we get back to dealing with all of the stuff that we should have been doing, the, the hip operations, the cancer scans, the blood tests, which, which will be coming down the road at us. Um, that's me. I mean, you know, I think it would be great. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to, to see that people are, are looking in, in the direction of life sciences, because I think you know, we, we do have a real strength in the East Midlands, particularly in med tech, um, which is not generally acknowledged. Um, and, and actually, you, you can tell the guys that work in life sciences because we're the ones that don't have a suntan, um, because none of us got furloughed. And, and actually, I've worked more hours probably in the last one. Well, uh, interesting. Here's one for you to take away. Um, I spoke to a uh, head of IT at one of our major trusts in the East Midlands, and he said he managed to complete more projects in the 12 weeks of the initial crisis with COVID than he had managed in the previous 18 years working at the trust. Um, 
so yeah there is a new normal um but there is also a reversion back to um the old normal and i think that in the short term people didn't ask how much yeah, they asked how quick the challenge going forward i think for people repurposing is is that um they are going to go back to asking how much because whether you like it or not we're, we're in a major economic crisis and whilst they've thrown money at the nhs and and health services in the short term it's not sustainable um that's me I, i'm more than happy to be contacted and have further discussions the, the guys at medilink and Teresa are, are great as well we, we run a number of workshops around um understanding how to engage and sell and and get into the nhs and you know i'd be more than happy for any of you guys to come along all our services are free um so you know please please feel free to engage with us as you as you see fit excellent thank you very much uh nick that was that was fantastic um i mean obviously any information that we receive from Teresa or, or indeed nick will will share with our members and it, obviously if anybody wants to come along to this workshop then then please do um, I'm very conscious of time, but I did have one quick question I wanted to ask Nick, um, if you could address that, because I totally get your point that you need to approach the NSS and said, look, you know, we're, we're not trying to flog you, whatever. We're actually here to solve a problem, and, and this is how we'll solve your problem. But surely a key aspect of that is, is how do you know what the problems are? I, I, is there any support that you give in that, in that sort of area? So, th so absolutely there is. You can come and talk to us. Um, one of the really interesting things, it was, it was interesting listening to the guys earlier saying, oh, I can't show you this because it's under NDA, I can't show you this. Everything about the health service is in the public domain. Um, you want a really, really dull day, sit and read CCG or, or trust board minutes and risk registers because they'll flag you straight away. If it's on a risk register and you've got a solution to that problem, they will rip your arm off. Um, to do it but they're all out there um, now when I used to sell to the NHS I used to think the important thing was that I was walking through the front doors of the hospital nine o'clock on a Monday morning what I actually should have been doing is probably one day a week visiting people and four days a week reading up on what their challenges and what their direction was what the long-term plan said um, and, and just having a look at the board minutes so it's all out there in the public domain um, we're going to have the same we're going to have the same kind of priorities going forward which is diabetes obesity cancer mental health um and and actually i think the other one that, that we're storing up is respiratory so if you if you're in the respiratory field um because every single patient coming out post covid has been shown to have some degree of uh, lung fibrosis now that's a long-term condition that's not going to go away and actually means that these patients are going to stay sick pretty much forever so there's a new long-term condition which is lung fibrosis that, that, that we're going to need to be able to address um, and I think the other thing to remember is so, so I had a really interesting discussion with Public Health England the other day um, so they're now no longer looking for any more COVID testing not interested if you've got a COVID test go away come back and tell me when you've got a test that will tell me whether the patient's got flu or the patient's got COVID because that's what they're worried about now is as we get towards the end of September we're going to have patients presenting and, and actually you're going to have to keep the flu patients and the COVID patients very separate but right now there's no rapid test that you could do that would tell you if the patient in front of you with a cough sore throat and a temperature is a COVID patient or is a flu patient now you need to know that within probably 10 minutes so i think that's the other thing to to do do some reading around your subject get to know a few people attend uh, yeah attend some of our our webinars and our uh, our sessions but yeah it's all publicly documented that's the great thing about working with the nhs we have to tell you everything excellent but but certainly your workshops um would would, in, would outline that as well. Uh, just one more quick question before we, we um, hand back over to, um, to Andrew. Um, a question from Mark. Um, does there appear to be any requirement for change to the amount of red tape as processes were a lot quicker during COVID? I mean, obviously we saw um, regulations being relaxed and things. Yeah. Do we see a lasting effect of that or is it going to revert straight back to what it was before? 
So I, 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 I was hoping that a lot of it would stick because a lot of the red tape is red tape for the sake of red tape. Um, but I, I've already seen some slippage back into stuff. So we were doing a, a care homes project with one of our uh, one of our digital accelerator companies. Now that was supposed to be a response to COVID. I'm now being told end of August before anything will deploy because it's, it's being sent to digital boards. Um, and, and you know that, that hideous spider web diagram that I put up earlier. Um, it, it, there's probably one not dissimilar to that appearing. So there is a, unfortunately, a slippage back to the new normal around the red tape and regulation. Um, and it, it, it's not helpful, I don't think. Um, and it's one of the reasons we were brought in was to try and support people to get through that quicker. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're kind of in, a, in, in a, a space in the moment. I think end of September, things will clarify a little bit as to what regulations are gonna fall back into place. Um, and when people are going to need to start complying with various things, because because right now the NHS has a blank check and, and that runs through till September. That will be reviewed and, and all of the regions of NHS England, so the Midlands region, are doing a reset and, and a reset and restore plan that should be published in about the next six weeks. And, and that will show you the systems that they're going to apply and where they see the actions that are going to be needed. So again, that, that will be a publicly published document. So keep an eye out for that because that will tell you what rules and regulations and hoops you're going to need to jump through. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Nick. Very, very Thank interesting. You. Um, I'm quite conscious of, of time. So um, I'd like now to hand over to Andrew Mayer, um, obviously uh, who runs the MAA, um, to talk to us about um, the pandemic and the, uh, and the aerospace industry. So Andrew, if I may hand over to you. Thanks very much, Pim. Just go to slideshow. Mm -hmm. So, so um, just to uh, reiterate something that came up earlier in the meeting, we did some workshops uh, a few months ago in the West Midlands with the West Midlands uh, Innovation Alliance and discovered, much to our surprise, that the, the closest innovation model to aerospace was health. Uh, so uh, largely due to the uh, regulatory uh, context and the uh, nature of having a, one large customer, albeit a fragmented one. Uh, so uh, I was surprised by that, but it, uh, it was very interesting. So um, I will go through these slides fairly quickly, but they will be available, as Pim has said, to everybody afterwards. So two themes for me just now. Uh, here's what the world looked like in February, uh, a rapidly growing industry in the Midlands, the blue line, following Airbus and Boeing aircraft production, the red line, and are projected to carry on expanding so that the industry would have more than doubled in size over, uh, in 10 years in the Midlands. And the gold line, employment having increased by 50% over several years as well. So a rapidly growing industry in the Midlands, pulled along by global demand for aircraft, particularly in East Asia. These are the aircraft that mattered to us, uh, the Boeing 787 and the Airbus A350, both of which have Rolls-Royce engines on them. Uh, but uh, we have other companies that supply into these aircraft, particularly the Airbus uh, aircraft. And these aircraft are used for long haul flights, as many of you will know. Smaller amount of work on the uh, military activities in the Midlands. We're very focused on the civil aerospace industry in the Midlands, 80% of our work versus the country as a whole, which is roughly 50-50. So clearly a big impact on air travel immediately but more importantly for us as a manufacturing group, big impact immediately on the demand for new aircraft. So if we use one of the typical uh, uh, air passenger measurement indices here, revenue passenger kilometers, uh, we can see the uh, internationally agreed data here, a big decline in flying in 2020, as we're all aware of. Uh, but for the year as a whole, bearing in mind that we were running at a close to 100% for the first three months, uh, a big decline in flying during the year, and then a recovery over time, 
and hence the you know all the questions of what's the shape of this recovery is it uh, v-shape u-shaped l-shape etc but this is what drives our industry and we can then map that into the effect in, on our region by looking at the different types of aircraft which is why i showed you the picture earlier the red line here is the deliveries in billions of dollars of narrow body or single aisle aircraft the ones you typically go on holiday in in europe a 737 made by boeing or an a320 series made by airbus the boeing aircraft was already in trouble because you may recall there were two accidents where two of them crashed a couple of years ago due to a, a flight control uh, design error uh, and that aircraft is grounded and production stopped hence the zigzag in the red line and those larger aircraft uh, demand flattening out after rapid growth, uh, but still continuing at a fairly high level compared to the past, more than double uh, the, the blue line. So the impact of the coronavirus on these two aircraft in particular, types of aircraft in particular, this is now the forecast. So there isn't really a recovery for much uh, until much later of the single aisle, the red line, um, with a decline uh, particularly in the current year. But uh, the, the dark blue line, the aircraft on which our region more or less depends, uh, is a much longer and slower recovery, largely because it's projected that the flying that will recover fastest is the short haul aircraft, which will replace long haul aircraft on some uh, routes, but also that those of us in Europe, for example, will be more willing to travel within Europe first and more reluctant to travel on long haul flights. So when we surveyed our members and asked them about the impact of the uh, coronavirus crisis on their revenues, uh, the average anticipated decline in revenue was 39% uh, in the current period. And if we map that onto what a year would then look like, noting that companies were working at high speed uh, through April, and that includes the many companies that were participating in the ventilator challenge, which, of course, didn't go back to work in June because they never stopped. Most of our industry just didn't stop and, and uh, hasn't stopped at all. Uh, something the government hasn't understood, of course. Uh, and the ventilator work, as Steve suggested, actually, and others have recognised, which is good. Uh, more than 40 companies in the Midlands alone uh, made ventilator parts, nearly all of those in the aerospace supply chain where we monitored that and published it. But the end of the year could look pretty difficult for many aerospace companies, and that's likely to continue into 2021. If we then take a macro view for the region as a whole, uh, really all you need to concentrate on is how big is that red, uh, uh, red area there, because that represents uh, graphically the fall in revenue for our region uh, over the current period and the length of the recession so definitely u-shaped uh, will take some time based on flying recovering uh, and then aircraft production recovering and of course when aircraft aren't flying there's less maintenance repair and overall activity required so that's also declined uh, rapidly too we have then developed a five-point plan as we've called it which we've published on our website to help our industry recover and we're now revising this plan to look at what the industry will look like in 2024, 2025, to make sure our industry recovers. Uh, we have a, a now a global competition to grab the recovery with our friends across the channel, for example, planning to grab our business uh, as the industry recovers and investing a lot of government money into it. And our government, of course, isn't. We've discussed the, uh, the government on a number of occasions in this call. I'm not going to go into that in detail, but it's a problem for us in our industry that our government doesn't have an industrial strategy and is um, a classic of uh, the kind of democracy that we run in this country in terms of its, its cabinet and its ability to uh, uh, develop sophisticated policies or, or, or otherwise. When we asked our member companies what their priorities were, big focus on people, uh, less focus on innovation in the current year, not really surprisingly. Next year, also a big focus on people. So in our industry, people are still concerned to make their workplaces safe and productive, and they expect this to continue into next year, uh, not, 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 some, not to be a problem that goes away quickly. 
within that, if we look at the new business, uh, and I thought this would be interesting for this group, uh, uh, an interest in diversification into new markets, not surprisingly, when the automotive industry is down, as in 2009, automotive companies are interested in aerospace. When the, aeros when the automotive industry recovers, that interest dissipates, not surprisingly, but it does give us fantastic opportunities in a period like this to look at cross-sector working. And similarly, when we looked at innovation, again, uh, exploitation of innovations in other markets was uh, seen as critical. So what are we currently doing? Uh, in the past, uh, we do a lot of conference activity, networking, exhibiting, trade missions. That's all gone, of course, currently. We don't expect to hold another physical meeting until January or February. We are able to continue with the networking. The Farnborough Air Show, which is due to be in a couple of weeks' time, has gone. Uh, trade missions, obviously, not as well. But our technology work is continuing apace, and I'll show you why to finish off. Uh, we have a concept in terms of developing new technology and innovation, which is all about bottom-up technology. There's plenty of national money has flowed into the top of this. Uh, little of it reaches the bottom, uh, but uh, we try to uh, take funding and work on helping small companies get into the aerospace supply chain, or if they're in it, to develop new technology within that. We've run a number of programs, uh, which I'm happy to talk to you about uh, at another point, uh, but all of them have involved to this kind of support. Uh, working with big organizations, because there are only a handful of us in our organization, uh, we provide the link between our network of 300 member companies and bigger programs very often. The Drama program is an additive manufacturing program run by the MTC that we're part of and is cross-sector uh, uh, by uh, not so much definition, but in practice. So we're running workshops on uh, other organizations that are doing work outside aerospace at the moment you'll find these on our website there's one next tuesday where we are looking at the application of additive manufacturing in the medical sector coincidentally uh, and we did other sectors earlier this week what i want to talk to you about is uh, the aerospace unlocking potential program um, which is a, a big new one uh, but you may hear about one called SciTech as well which is a cross-sector program we've been developing in the west midlands so the Aerospace Unlocking Potential is a new program. Uh, it is ERDF. Uh, most of you on this call will be aware that this funding is still available. The University of Nottingham is the lead partner. We are the delivery partner uh, and it's being run in this geography. So it covers the Silverstone area, including SEMLEP, so which is a bit beyond our normal geographical boundaries, uh, which we're pleased to be doing. Uh, and it has a number of activities that uh, you can get involved in. We ran some workshops on the five themes that we talked about earlier last uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and these will be available as broadcast shortly uh, through our website. Uh, we had an hour and a half on each of these themes over a week uh, and those are recorded and if you're interested in aerospace and understanding what, what, what's happening in the industry do let us know. So finally on aerospace uh, knocking potential uh, there is an email address there I'll put this in the slides that PIM sends out. You can also find this on the homepage of our website. And we are very interested in cross-sector work. All of our projects have a lot of cross-sector application. Uh, so uh, we're not at all shy of helping companies to enter the aerospace industry. And we're delighted when other organizations help our companies to diversify at points like this. So that's me, PIM. Fantastic, Andrew. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's great to hear. Um, I mean, if we look at Andrew's presentation and we look at Nick's presentation, I mean, there's, there's very clear opportunities there to engage with, with different organizations and, and learn about new industries and develop um, opportunities there for you, which, which is great to hear. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the, the story that Andrew was telling on the, on the aerospace industry, um, I mean, clearly, you know, it, it's a very challenging, challenging time. But I do think by you know, sort of collaboration and, and bringing people together, um, you know, we can move forward quite positively out of that, um, I should hope. And, and obviously, people like Teresa, uh, Nick and, and Andrew are all here to, to support with that, um, which I think is a very, very important message. Um, and I would encourage everybody to, to engage um, with all three of them and, and, and try, to move, try to move forward. Um, so obviously, I mean, this, this kind of concludes the, the, the presentation that we have. I mean, I would invite anybody, if they have any questions, to um, you know, use the chat functionality and, and, and ask us. Um, 
but but definitely thank you very much for that um andrew and and um you know i i trust that you know we can work together to to share your information in, in terms of the the broadcast and all that sort of stuff to our members as well and um, we already do that with Teresa and things um so there's a lot of stuff that we'll 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 try and do there um Teresa just sent in a, a reminder that um, they offer innovation grant support as well. Um, so again, you know, get in touch and, and find out what that's all about. Because um, there's, there's two, I think, um, you know, potentially interesting areas there for our companies to get involved in, but also for medical companies to move into aerospace, aerospace companies to move into, um, you know, the STC region um, and, and, and Medlink as well. So I think hopefully, you know, this event can be the start of, of, of a lot more cross-pollination between our industries and, 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 uh, and all of us bringing people together um, for mutual collaboration um, and things. Um, so I'm, I'm very conscious of time because we said we're going to add this uh, uh, and is at, at about one o'clock. Um, we're obviously sort of about five minutes, five minutes over that. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll wrap it up here. Um, so I'd like to thank um, our speakers an awful lot um, for participating. I think it's all been fascinating, really interesting presentation. So thank you all. Um, what I would like to do just to, to wrap up is that I've got a little bit of a feedback poll um, for people to, to complete, um, which is not going to take very long at all. Um, it's only about five questions or so. So if you wouldn't mind having a um, a go at filling that in that should all appear on your screen now um, so please just um, jab at the appropriate answers if you can please um, I'll, I'll wrap it up here for um, the, the, the people that are watching this on YouTube so thank you very much for watching I hope you find it informative do please get in touch um, with any of the of the speakers from the from the information that you've seen on the slides or indeed contact us at the STC and, and we can put you in touch so uh, thank you very much for watching and see you again <laughs>